Hey everyone, my name is Logan Ransley and welcome to the Landlord Studio podcast. This show is all about giving you the best real estate advice from industry leaders so you can learn to grow your real estate business and build long-term wealth. Let's cue the intro. Before we jump into today's episode, make sure you click the subscribe button below so you can get notified of every episode we release. And in today's episode, we are interviewing Matt, Mr. Matt McKeever. Matt McKeever is a real estate investor, YouTuber, a registered CPA, event planner, and co-founder of Real Estate Rat Pack. At the age of 31, Matt became a full-time real estate entrepreneur by beginning his investing journey in London, Ontario. And in 2005, Matt quickly built up his real estate portfolio, implementing the Brewer strategy, which we'll get into soon. <laughs> At any given point, uh, he currently has 15 to 20 properties, usually over 50 units or 100 tenants. Firstly, that, that's an awesome achievement, brother. Like, how are you going today? Appreciate all that. Yeah, uh, today's a great day, like every day. And uh, yeah, real estate investing definitely was the gateway to my financial freedom. So really happy I stumbled upon it at the age I did. Yeah, that's awesome. I always like starting the podcast with a bit of an icebreaker question. Um, do you have a favorite quote and why is that your favorite quote? Yeah. To put you on the spot. <laughs> I, I've definitely got lots of favorite quotes, but one that I seem to be referencing more and more these days is a quote from Bill Gates. And the mm. quote is people overestimate what they can accomplish in a year and underestimate what they can accomplish in a decade. And that to me yeah. just is such a powerful statement. It personally resonates very true with myself. I'm 35 right now. And actually, when I turned 25, I decided that I was going to quit the rat race 10 years from then. So I was like, when I turn 35, I'm going to quit the rat race, quit being a, an accountant, and just become a full-time real estate investor. And mm -hmm. as part of that, I literally, on my 25th birthday, downloaded an app on my phone that would just count down the days till my 35th birthday. So I'd be the guy at like parties or at a bar, and someone would be like, what's new with you? And I'd be like oh, like 2,649 days till I quit the rat race. <laughs> and the reason it resonates so powerfully with me now is I ended up accomplishing that in six years. And it didn't take the exact form I originally thought it was going to. But at the same time, with hindsight, I don't even feel like I worked that hard really at that goal. I just kind of chipped away at it. You know, like yeah. I'd go look at a few properties. I'd buy one if it makes sense. And I just kind of stumbled my way through my real estate investing journey. And now that I'm 35 and I've had those 10 years of experience, I can't help but look forward. And like these days I have really big, hairy, audacious goals. Like I love just like thinking massive because my thoughts are again, that concept of shoot for the stars and worst case you'll hit the moon is definitely mm -hmm. something that resonates as well, very powerfully with me. So these days I'm just constantly asking myself, can I accomplish more over the long term if I just think bigger? Yeah. Do you reckon by having that like, that countdown of days you just like in comparison to not doing that um do you reckon that puts you in a completely different mindset and just allows you to actually achieve what you're trying to achieve yeah the power behind having that app and then making it public to my friends and family mm. created such a strong sense of accountability where it really entrenched that future vision of myself as being core to my current identity yeah so because i'd made so many people aware of it like it was the best accountability I could have ever hoped for because I guess one thing I've discovered with time is personally having big goals is kind of scary and we're very precious with those goals and it can be scary to introduce them to the world or the universe because the world at times can be a harsh place. Yeah. And a lot of people are, unfortunately, they're crabs in a bucket, right? When one crab tries to climb out, the rest will pull them back down. So sometimes when you've got those big, scary audacious goals, it, it can be scary to share it with anyone for fear that they're going to poke holes in it, or they're going to try and rip it down. But at the same time, if you don't like, I'm not a big like woo woo person, like wish it and you'll achieve it sort of thing. But if you're not comfortable with your goals and saying them out loud in a public forum, again, I have to question your level of dedication and commitment to it. Yeah. So what I found to be a very helpful way to kind of insulate or protect my goals is I like to hide them in a joke. And so when I was like, you know, counting down the days to 35, the joke was how many days till my birthday. 
And so it was a way to like tell people my goal, but like we didn't really focus on it. Like it wasn't like I'm going to save a million dollars and be a millionaire at 35. It'd be a lot easier for people to poke their holes on that and be like, listen, I'm 50 years old and I didn't get to be a millionaire at that age. So there's no way you can do it. Yeah. And so these days, like, you know, I've got some really big goals for the next five years for myself. Mm. And rather than say a dollar amount. So like one of the goals is very financial oriented. And what it really represents to me is just financial abundance and wanting complete abundance in my life. But rather than say like, I want to be a hundred millionaire, or I want to be a billionaire or throwing out some random abstract number. I like to make a joke of it and say, I want private jet wealth. Now it doesn't even mean I want a private nice. jet. It means I want so much abundance that I could afford it. And because I frame it that way, I find people are much more conducive towards it. They'll just make a joke back at me and be like, oh man, well, once you get the jet, I, you know, dibs on shotgun or whatever. And then you <laughs> kind of joke and laugh about it. I've made my intentions clear to them without necessarily really being vulnerable. Yeah. Yeah, that's awesome. We actually have a term for what you were talking about with the crabs in the bucket here in New Zealand or Australia uh, as well. We call it tall poppy syndrome. And it's basically as the as the poppy grows above everyone else, everyone pulls them down. <laughs> so gotcha, yeah. A, same terminology, just different across the world. But yeah, it's, it's, I get, it's quite a hard thing to deal with, but particularly if you're ambitious and you've got lots of dreams and goals. Um, your social peers and like how they build you up is uh, so important. Um, so if if, it, if they're not doing that and they're pulling you down, then yes, yeah, it's, it's it's a hard one to deal with, right? So mm -hmm. I, let's dive straight into it. You you speak a lot about the brewer strategy B and four R's across social media. Um, for listeners who don't know what this is, tell them a bit about this and why you do this particular strategy. Absolutely. So the Burr Investment Strategy stands for buy, renovate, rent, refinance, and repeat. And so just to, without spending a lot of time on it, buy, obviously you go find an underperforming asset or property that's been neglected. Then you renovate it. So you bring it up to its highest, best, most efficient use. Now, because we've you know implemented strategic renovations, we're getting a bigger bang for our buck. So it's not like $1 in creates $1 of value. Ideally, $1 in creates more than one dollar of value and so through those strategic renovations things like at least in my market adding dishwashers or laundry to units can allow us then to command a higher rent price than what we were getting before and often again that return on investment is very accretive so then the next hour is rent out the property um so again we're buy it undervalued renovate it to bring it up to its highest best use then we're going to rent it out and once we rent it out then we're going to command top dollar because we fixed up the unit. Now, because we've commanded top dollar, we can go back to our lender, the bank and say, Hey, look, I did all these renovations. It's increased the value. I can show I've increased the value because I've dramatically increased the rents. And now you can refinance and ideally in a perfect burr, the whole goal is to, you know, get all your money back out. So a perfect burr would literally be by the time I'm done refinancing, I don't have a dollar of my hard earned money tied up in that property yeah. and then moving beyond that is repeating the process so because we're able to implement it in this manner we can really be effective with how we go about uh, building our portfolio so for a lot of new investors one of the things i find that they struggle with is capital you know they they save up enough money to buy a property a year or a property every other year but then they can't see a clear path on how to scale the business outside of just getting rich or you know, stumbling into a giant pot of money. Mm. Well, for me at the start, I was very focused on trying to just use my own capital or the capital of my close friends. And so the burn investment strategy was a great way to speed up the velocity of my money because I could recycle it over a short period of time. So in general, for these burr properties that I was documenting on my YouTube channel, I would be able to complete the project in anywhere from kind of eight weeks to a year. And that allowed me to recycle my money a lot faster and I could reuse the same down payment funds again and again, as long as I was implementing the burst strategy in what we call like a perfect manner where I got all my capital back. Yeah. So where did you learn this? Did you learn this from bigger pockets, Brandon Turner? He, I guess he's quite well renowned for the strategy, right? Mm hmm. So I had kind of stumbled upon this idea of flip to yourself. And that's what a lot of investors here in Southwestern Ontario were referring to it as. But then 
Uh, around 2016 is when I left my day job, went full time into real estate investing. I did stumble upon Bigger Pockets and it just crystallized it for me. I was like, okay, like one, it was just such an easy way to explain the business model. And two, fortunately, a lot of the markets that Brandon Turner was looking at weren't that dissimilar to my market. So you could do a 1% deal, right? So again, for myself, I find that one of the most important keys to success is just believing it's possible. And yeah. so for a lot of us, we need like a Roger Bannister, someone to run that four minute mile for us first, and then we'll believe it's possible. Yeah. I think for myself, Brandon Turner was definitely one of my Roger Bannisters. He was just someone that was like, yeah, like you just buy the property, you do this and da, 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 refinance it and go buy the next one. I was like, yeah. oh, this is really cool. And then I found a few local investors. They were like, oh, that's like flip to yourself. Yeah, we've kind of done that off and on. I'm like, okay, so this guy on the internet saying it's true. He's got a very slick presentation of it. And I found some local investors that are also telling me it's possible. Yeah. So that really gave me the confidence just to like, you know, jump into it full steam ahead rather than like a lot of times as investors, we kind of like try and dip a toe into it. But because we don't fully commit, it's really easy to rationalize or talk ourselves out of, you know, why it's not going to work for us. Yeah. I like that Roger Bannister uh, story, actually. It's shared a, a lot across, um, I guess, online business world as well. Uh, definitely heard the likes of like Russell Brunson talking about this. And um, yeah, I think it's really cool because it it gives you a different perspective. Once you're at this point where you think something's impossible and then you see someone achieve it and you're like, ah, oh, actually this person's done it. So, you know, maybe I could do this as well. So yeah, I think that's really cool. Um, and particularly in real estate, like if you can get that from a real estate perspective, uh, mm -hmm. it just gives you that, you know, that more confidence to go out and actually achieve what you want to achieve, right? What's uh, what's the biggest mistake you've seen or you've made in real estate investing? Yeah, I've made a lot of mistakes. I think the one that is kind of cliche that I'll get out of the way and then I'll move on to some real ones is like, yeah. <laughs> I regret all the properties I didn't buy. I regret all the deals I didn't do. And that yeah. definitely is true for me. So honestly, it's more the opportunities I missed out on. But mm. from a practical, tactical standpoint, I've made a ton of mistakes. And I think the the mistakes I made that I see a lot of other first time investors make is hiring the wrong people. Mm. So oftentimes we hire who's available or who's easily available rather than the right person. So with time and experience, I've realized that to really build a successful scalable business, and that word's key there, scalable business, not a real estate hobby, you really do need to focus on the who. Who, yeah. is, who is it that I'm gonna hire or outsource this task to so that I can focus on my highest best use of time? So for Matt McKeever, my highest best use of time is really you know deal analysis, deal structure, negotiating, those are the tasks where I can really move the needle on my real estate empire. Whereas painting my unit myself or negotiating with a tenant over $10 or something immaterial like that is really a waste of my time. So at the start, like a lot of investors, I spent way too long in the business working in it, you know, doing all the renovations myself. But then secondly, when it did become time to start outsourcing, I hired who was easily available and immediately within my grasp. And it was, I hired the wrong people, right? I hired underperforming contractors that, you know, just wouldn't follow through, you know, people that would skim from job sites, all that stuff. So like, you know, from eventually letting go a contractor and then having him break into our corporate office. And like, literally he, I don't even know what he was thinking. He flipped the desk, like this hundred pound desk upside down and just like in this anger. And like, you know, it'd be easy for a person to naturally think, well, like he was being unreasonable. I didn't put him, you know, like that should have never happened. But at the end of the day, it wasn't like it was a flashpoint moment and it happened. We were hit. This was a train, a very slow moving train wreck, right? That like yeah, yeah. with hindsight, I could see from day one when I hired him, like I didn't do a proper interview process. I didn't check yeah. references appropriately. All those classic mistakes, right? Yeah. And then compromising on things that you know are critical to the success of your business, but you compromise for convenience sake. So to me, like getting a good contractor, you know, doing your due diligence when selecting tenants is also critical. So like I've had one or two absolute horror stories with uh, tenants in my properties. Thankfully, whenever I put in those, you know, the worst tenants, it was at a point when I was scaling. So I already had kind of a robust foundation so I could absorb that cost. But what, yeah. 
the way I've started viewing real estate investing is there's this concept, uh, the Fermi paradox in science. And it's this entire concept of like, why haven't we found intelligent life out there? You know, like we're sending out all these radio signals. You'd think we'd receive radio signals from other intelligent life. And a byproduct of the Fermi paradox was a theory called the great filter theory. And so this was the idea that there must be different things that block or stop intelligent life from evolving or developing. And I kind of view real estate as the same thing because I look around, I'm like, man, there's so many people that believe real estate will get you rich eventually if you stick with it. And yet so few people actually do. What's going on here? And I think that there's several great filters for us as real estate investors. And one of the great filters is like hiring the wrong contractor. And unfortunately, if you do that on your very first deal, there's a chance you're not going to survive. There's a chance you're going to get either discouraged or you're going to lose all your money taken advantage of, and you'll just give up there. And so I was lucky enough to experience that at a further along stage so that I could survive kind of that setback. Mm. And same with like any of the tenants from hell that I've had. So I think it's inevitable as a landlord that you're going to go through all these filters. It's just the timing of when it happens to you is definitely subjective. And so, you know, at the start, really just doing your due diligence, checking references, or at least ways to postpone that pain point. That filter theory is quite interesting. And I think it's actually very relevant to not only real estate investing, but to business, to your job, to so many different parts of your life. Um, it's it's just, you just have to anticipate that something is going to happen, right? Mm -hmm. Something is going to throw you off the rails or you know shake your foundation but you kind of just have to be prepared for that right which is i guess all about the systems that you have but also some of the uh lessons that you learn along those ways making sure you don't you know just forget that lesson and <laughs> repeat the same mistakes right yeah and it's also a big part mindset as well right mm. so there's a slogan that myself and my team live by i'm wearing a hat right now that says I'm it but profit. the slogan is problems or profits yeah. And this really arrived, I host a lot of local networking events for real estate investors and people focused on personal finance. And I noticed as being the host, people would always come up to me with their problems. And they'd be like, Matt, I'm going through this, 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 this. And I'd be like, oh man, like you solve this and all of a sudden you're gonna make money. And literally I started to realize a pattern here where there's some people that they view everything as an opportunity, a challenge, something to be overcome. And other people view the exact same situation as a roadblock you know, the death knoll, it's like, it's the end of the line. Mm. And so much of that is about that mindset. So to me, it's like, if you decide that you're going to be a successful real estate investor, your success is inevitable, just the timing is still up for debate. Yeah. And so it's really about like, you know, people have done this before. Yeah. A lot of people have actually done this before and made money with real estate, as long as you believe that's true. Now it's just a matter of you figuring out how they did it and how you can replicate it in your own form. Yeah. Just touching back on your uh, story about hiring the wrong people, et cetera. We have a lot of real estate investors and landlords using our software to self-manage their properties. How do you typically manage your properties? Do you outsource it to property managers or do you bring it all in house and actually hire a team to do it? How does that work for you? Yeah, I've done a little bit of everything at this point. So from self-managing at the start to kind of outsourcing to insourcing to I actually started my own software company for landlords in Ontario, Canada, oh, nice. specifically <laughs> to then moving on to insourcing again. So, yeah. you know, to me, there's an ebb and flow with the entire process right now, the way it works today, I've got two people that work for me full time, just as property managers, one manages my my old portfolio. So all the little duplexes and fourplexes I gathered over time, and in that portfolio, there's maybe right now, I don't know, 60, 80 units that she manages. And then I've got a new business that's in the process that's just about a year old now that's we burr apartment buildings. So taking the same principle, but just going after like 10, 20, 30 unit buildings. And we hired a different type of property manager, again, to work full time for us. But we found someone that was already managing a 200 unit building for a REIT, a real estate investment trust here in Canada, and someone who's a business model that we're looking to replicate just in a slight, just in our own nuanced way. Yeah. And so to me, you know, the way I hired wrong at first was just like, 
you know, like who's the first person I can grab that's not going to like light my property on fire immediately. <laughs> yeah. Whereas now it's much more nuanced. We're like, no, we're going to go through multiple interviews. Like yeah. my personal assistant's going to check all of your references and qualifications. Like, and we're not also going to like have those generic, you know, like, you know, what's your biggest, uh, you know, struggle as a worker. And then they say, well, I'm just work too hard. Right. Like I, I actually spent some time really trying to learn how to get better at the interview process. Yeah. And so actually one of the things that I think you did really well on your podcast that we try and implement with our interview process is those icebreaker questions, questions that are outside of normal, mm. because it's really easy. Like, had you asked me a traditional real estate question, I click world repeat and I fall into that thought pattern yeah. and it will take something outside of normal to disrupt me. Yeah. And so like one of my favorite tips right now is we actually, the very first thing I'm going to do is I'll ask you five random questions from a random question generator. Yeah. But <laughs> one of those questions isn't actually random. It's one that I purposely see in there. And it was asked to me by someone once. And I was like, this is amazing. <laughs> and it was literally just, what's the most expensive thing you've ever broken? Ooh. <laughs> and you can learn so much from a person because of that question. Because one, do they take ownership? Yeah. Or are they going to tell you a story about how something expensive broken, but it's really their little brother's fault or their cousin's or whoever's fault. And then two, you know, even just like how that story comes into light and whether they talk about whether they learned something from it or whether it was just an accident and shit happens. Yeah. I'm trying to think of my one. I think it was probably a glass mantelpiece of some sort that was owned by my family. <laughs> yeah. But I'll, I'll take responsibility for that one. <laughs> <laughs> yeah awesome um i guess uh a curious question that i had is so so again like a lot of our users are very much focused on the accounting and the financial pieces of their business um, while using landlord studio what is the number one most important financial metric that you kind of keep in in your view or in your eye while you're running your rental properties yeah so uh, I'm definitely involved more in the acquisition at mm. this stage in the game. So the things that we really focus on from an acquisition is like just a handful of rules of thumb that allow us to determine whether it's worth doing deeper research. And so it, it actually is very cliche. And sometimes I get people hating on my YouTube channel because they're like, you can't do it this simply <laughs> like that. Like we literally look at like the 1% rule Can the property meet or exceed the 1% rule. Yeah. And if it does, then we're going to dig deeper into it. We also look at, you know, where the rents are today, what sort of rent lift we can get, what our price per unit is as well. And really like just a handful of those rules of thumb. Now on the day-to-day -day operations, what we really focus on is communication. So I believe that 99% of problems are due to a lack of communication or a misinterpretation of yeah. communication. So having regular huddles. So every Tuesday morning and Friday afternoon, we have a Zoom call with our team. So like our the guy that leads our contracting division and my full-time property manager for the apartment building business. We jump on a Zoom call and just discuss where everyone's at. Yeah. They don't necessarily take very long, 15, 30 minutes. And then beyond that, just setting certain financial benchmarks, right? So for us, one of the easy ones is cash flow per door. So not necessarily on an individual unit basis, but on a building basis, right? We know what we believe the cash flow per door should be. And once you've got any variations from that, then you need to get some sort of report or explanation behind uh, why we're off this month. Yeah. Awesome. It's really interesting. I, I like those Zoom calls. I think that it's really important to have kind of clear communication. And often, like, if you don't do it, then things just start crumbling down and, you know, systems become less efficient. And yeah, yeah. It just, it's very hard to scale it, without a good people around you and having that kind of clear expectation and yeah. Mm -hmm. And it's really easy for us as real estate investors to think that we're investors and we're not business owners. Yeah. But we actually totally. are business owners yeah. in addition to being investors. And what you need to understand about business is every business has a culture. And so if you're not dictating that culture, then just happenstance and your actions are. And so if you're never like, if the only time you talk to your property manager is when you're arguing about a rent reduction or why they didn't hit a certain metric, that's the culture you're creating in your little business. Even if it's just an outsourced property manager, if the only time that you're ever communicating with them is conflict, 
they're not going to want to communicate with you. So they're going to hide things and they're going to avoid things and they're not going to bring it up as fast as possible. And what you end up finding is you end up with this bloated organization. That's the Titanic that isn't nimble whatsoever. And you can't turn. Yeah. Whereas if you're in regular communication and you're communicating, even when it isn't necessary. Yeah. So you're really just providing them an open forum to air any grievances or be listened to or things of that nature. It, it creates such a more conductive environment for actually getting results. And that's really what we're all focused on, right? It's getting yeah, the results. Ex yeah, exactly. Um, and yeah, not just real estate businesses, but all businesses should have, have that aspect if they want to succeed in some way, shape or form, you know. Um, finally, what advice would you give to young entrepreneurs or people that are looking to try and invest their money to get out of the corporate world? to escape that nine to five, um, what steps should they take first? Yeah, for me, the very first thing is investing a little bit into your mindset and just really getting like, believing that this is possible. Yeah. Cause like you can do all the research, you can consume all the information, but if you don't believe it's possible, you're never going to take action. Yeah. And so uh, talking about another great quote, Tim Ferriss has a quote that says, if more information was the answer, we'd all be millionaires with six pack abs. <laughs> because making money and being in shape are actually pretty simple concepts overall, but it's the consistent action. It's being yeah. persistent with it. That's really difficult for us. So mm -hmm. in 2020, I really started a theme with a lot of my social media content. And that theme is make more offers, get more deals. So I can't tell you the number of people that talk to me and complain about how there's no deals about how you can make money 10 years ago in real estate, but it's impossible now. And I simply ask one question. How many offers have you made this month? If the answer is zero, I can tell you what your problem is. It's that you're not making enough offers. And unfortunately, a lot of us treat making offers as if we've got one shot, right? Like this is your only shot to make it. To me, it's like anything else. You need to put in the reps. You need to put in the practice. Yeah. So understand there's no silver bullets. There's not one thing I can tell you that will convince any seller to sell to you at any price. We all want to look for those silver bullets. And sometimes we almost need to believe in them a little bit to just even commit and put in the initial hard work necessary yeah. to overcome our initial inertia. But at the end of the day, everything you want is on the other side of hard work. Now, yeah. sometimes we can reduce the amount of hard work necessary by getting mentorship or learning the right information or having good tools. But at the end of the day, it's still about us taking ownership and being willing to put in whatever works necessary to get the result we committed to. Totally. Um, I like the the quote that's kind of like people always start with a lot of momentum, a um, lot of inspiration, a lot of aspirations. And then when they hit that dip, which is that first kind of filter, um, mm -hmm. most people just drop off and they're like, oh, OK, this is too hard. I can't do this. It's, I guess it's the ones that actually go into that dip and then come out the other side are the ones that kind of had that success that they're looking for. Right. Um, yeah. And that's why I say the mindset's so important. Right. Like. If, if you just have it in your mindset that you're a winner, and now that doesn't mean that like you just meditate 10 hours a day thinking about winning. It's just like, no, I'm a winner and winners find ways to solve problems, right? They overcome obstacles. They yeah. don't give up. And if you can really internalize that, there's always an answer to whatever question or obstacle you're coming across. Like sometimes we treat it as if this is solely unique, that we're the first person to ever experience this. I can just guarantee you, you're not that special. And that's a good thing. It means that someone else has already broken that barrier. And yeah. It's just a matter of either you refiguring it out or you finding how out how they did it and replicating their model. Yeah, I, I really like that. Well, really appreciate you coming on today's uh, podcast, Matt. Um, where should our audience go to find out more about you? Yeah, so everywhere social media is, I'll be there. So just look me up, Matt McKeever, whether it's on YouTube, Facebook, Instagram, LinkedIn, TikTok, Twitter, <laughs> we're everywhere. Uh, everywhere. Definitely YouTube is my primary. So yeah. that's where I've got the biggest following. We produce daily videos for real estate investors on my YouTube channel. So I always love it when people interact with me in the comment section there. But yeah, yeah. just find me anywhere on social media. Perfect. Well, thank you very much for everyone listening in uh, today. Again, hit the subscribe button below so you can get notified of every episode that we release. And be sure to check out the Landlord Studio blog as well at uh, www.landlordstudio.com slash blog. We release uh, new resources every week along with these podcast episodes. 
Really appreciate you coming in today's show, Matt, and I hope you have a great rest of your week. Thank <laughs> you.